Porsche is putting the third generation of the Cayman on the road. We're testing the especially sporty S version on a racetrack and on a rural road. The Cayman S has been completely revamped. The engineers paid special attention to reducing the sports car's weight. Porsche's head of research and development, Wolfgang Hatz, says the company went for an intelligent, light construction with lots of aluminum. The basic chassis is 50 kilos lighter than its predecessor, and the overall weight of the car is 100 to 200 kilos lighter than cars competing in the same category. To achieve this, the whole car had to be redeveloped. The 239 kilowatt or 325 horsepower six-cylinder engine with 370 newton meters of torque takes the Cayman S from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.9 seconds. Pressing the Sport Plus button shaves off another 0.2 seconds. The car's top speed is 281 kilometers per hour. Porsche optimistically rates fuel consumption at 8 liters per 100 kilometers. Thanks to the Cayman S's new stiff chassis, it maneuvers effortlessly across every tarmac. And stopping is no problem either, with an extremely robust four-cylinder aluminum monoblock brake. Former race car driver Walter Ruel test drove the Cayman S on the Porta Mao racetrack in Portugal. Ruel is impressed with the car's long wheelbase and the front axle's broad track, which he says is a big step forward in good support and good steering. He loves how stiff the chassis has become, 40% stiffer than its predecessor, which was already stiff. And that makes for very precise control over the car. The Cayman S's engine is no longer in the rear, like in the 911, but in the middle behind the seats. That's why it's called a middle engine. And there's good reason for putting it here. A middle engine puts the center of gravity between the two axles. Rohr compares this to putting a heavy potted plant on a table. It's most stable when put in the middle, not at the edge. The laws of physics make this the best arrangement. The Cayman S is the epitome of elegance under the morning sun in Lagos, Portugal. Its exterior has been redone too. Gentle lines and curves give it its own character. The standard by Zenon headlights make for a playful appearance. And it has no aerodynamic faults. The Cayman S stands on 19-inch wheel rims. The smooth lines are also found at the back, where the LED rear lights run as far as the trunk's lower edge. Walter Ruhl says the Cayman S is made for the racetrack, and he ought to know. Middle-engine cars are typical race cars. They handle wonderfully and respond perfectly to steering, just what every race car driver wants. Of course, you don't have to be a race car driver to like the Cayman S. The equipment list includes active distance and speed regulators, a Burmester sound system, and keyless access. The Cayman has two trunks. The front one holds almost 150 liters. And 275 liters will fit in the rear trunk. That makes a total of 425 liters of loading capacity. The Cayman's interior keeps up its end. When you step on the gas pedal, you hear the sound of a well-tuned engine. The materials here are all well-crafted. The PDK automatic shift is in the upward-sloping central console. The large, easily surveyed board monitor is integrated in the leather frame dashboard. The all-leather bucket seats show the car's affinity to racing too, keeping the driver in the saddle even in tight, fast curves. 
In Germany, the price of the new Cayman starts at 51,000 euros. The S variant, we tested, costs another 16,000. Fuel prices in Europe are a one-way street, only going up. And that means the cost of individual mobility too keeps going up. But as our car tester Matas Kurat says, staying home from work might not be the best solution. A good alternative may be a fuel-efficient car. Almost every manufacturer has one or two such models. Kurat has picked out two for a comparison. Können sollen und ich habe mir heute mal zwei ausgesucht. First is the Volvo V40. The Swedish compact, available only as a four-door fastback, has been on the market since 2012. It has plenty of standard and optional safety features, like a pedestrian airbag and an emergency brake assist. But of course, extras add weight. The 84 kilowatt diesel engine in our test car has to push a total of one and a half tons. The interior has clear Swedish lines and feels roomy. The seats are comfortable and electric adjustment is optional, but every extra is more weight on the scales. Candidate number two is the BMW 116D in the Efficient Dynamics Edition. It's available as a three-door or a five-door. It too has good safety features, but weighs just under 1.4 tons so that its 85 kilowatt engine has less mass to accelerate. But it's up to the driver whether to drive faster or burn less fuel. The arrangement of the controls makes the driver's seat a little confusing, but you get used to them quickly. Matas Kurat wants a controlled experiment, so the two cars will be exposed to the same traffic situations. But since he can't drive both cars at the same time, he's recruited Francesco Camarata to drive the other car. Matas gives Francesco his choice, and his colleague takes the Volvo. So Matas will start with a BMW. They'll drive a 75-kilometer route, beginning with 14 kilometers of country road. The Volvo's board computer says the car is consuming 3.8 liters of diesel on this stretch, while the BMW's computer says it is burning just 2.6 liters. The next phase is 13 kilometers on an expressway with a 100 kilometer an hour speed limit. Here, the BMW's fuel consumption rises to 3.5 liters per 100 kilometers, and the Volvo's climbs to 3.9. Our simulated commuter route takes us through the city too, of course. Five kilometers aren't a great distance, but in town, they take a while. Then we have a short stretch of Autobahn before we turn off onto a country road again for a shortcut. And just before the test finishes, we speed up on a final six kilometers of Autobahn. Here, the computers say the Volvo is consuming 4.4 liters and the BMW 4.1 liters per 100 kilometers. And we're alerted that we aren't driving ecologically. After a drive of a little over an hour, our two test drivers stop on a parking lot not far from where they started. Time to compare notes. Matas asked Francesco for his impression of the Volvo. Francesco says the design and workmanship are good, but the tiny engine doesn't have enough pep. You have to really step on the gas to make anything happen. Matas Kurat, still for a controlled experiment, remarks that people have different driving styles, so now the two testers will drive the same route again, but trade cars. Let's go! So it's off for a second round. So far the BMW has been thriftier with fuel. Now we'll see whether that was because of a difference in the testers' driving styles. One thing is clear, 
Both cars have almost equally powerful 1.6-liter turbo diesel direct injection engines. According to the manufacturer's claims, the Volvo consumes less fuel. But in our test, it looks like the BMW is more fuel efficient. The reason for this might be that the Volvo weighs 100 kilograms more than the BMW. But the tires used could play a role as well. Little tricks like skillful use of the automatic start-stop function also save fuel. And as we all heard when we learned to drive, smooth acceleration and thinking ahead cut fuel consumption too. After driving a total of 150 kilometers, now we'll get an impartial judgment at the pump, where both cars filled their tanks at the beginning. Matas asked his colleague Francesco how he liked the BMW. Francesco says the BMW's interior seems more adult than the Volvo's. The materials and workmanship are top notch. Matas wants to know how it drives. Francesco says he likes the BMW's solid chassis better than the Volvo's more flexible one, which may be fine for urban driving and housewives. Mata says that, according to the board computer, the Volvo averaged 4.4 liters per 100 kilometers, and Francesco says the BMW's gives exactly the same figure. That would mean both use the same amount of fuel. Filling the tanks again will show whether that's true. The moment of truth approaches. How good are the board computers? The calibrated fuel pumps show that the computers aren't entirely accurate. For 150 kilometers, the BMW used 7.2 liters of fuel and the Volvo 7.8. Matas calculates that the Volvo actually consumed 5.2 liters, not 4.4 liters, per 100 kilometers. Francesco calculates the BMW at 4.8 liters. Mata says it's only fair to remember that the cars have winter tires and that the drivers use the heaters and a bit of seat heating. But of course, anyone who drove a car would do that too. Francesco agrees. Mata wonders if anyone would buy seat heating if they didn't want to use it. But to save a little more on fuel, it might help to take a country road instead of the Autobahn and to do without extras like seat heating. As soon as the sun comes out, so do the convertibles. The new Beetle convertible is no exception. It cuts a fine figure, whether its electronic soft top is open or closed. The Beetle design has become a classic. We tested out the latest model. At first glance, the Beetle convertible harks back to another era. After all, the model name has been knocking about since 1949. But the new convertible has moved with the times and doesn't play the cute card like its predecessor. Volkswagen designer Andreas Mint points out that the 6 centimeter increase in width gives the car a sportier feel, which he says also leads to improved performance on the road. The characteristic headlights, resembling cartoonish eyes, have been modernized, but they're as alluring as ever. The soft top adds to the car's retro feel. What's more, opening and closing it does not affect trunk capacity. The latest generation Beetle is all about customization. There are 11 different interior fabrics and leather to choose from. Upgrades include ambient interior lighting, a multifunction leather trim sports steering wheel, and a color match dashboard. For the test model, Andreas Mint has chosen a slick and shiny black with a leather-finished interior. He points to the dashboard and areas around the doors as possible customization options, too. He says these choices mean drivers can match their cars to their personal taste. From an elegant and tasteful leather finish, to a shiny, sporty number. 
everyone can make their very own version of the beetle. The larger dimensions mean more comfort for passengers, too. In all, the new model is six centimeters wider and four longer than its predecessor. We meet Madeleine Berger at the waterfront in Nice, France. She agrees to take a closer look at the beetle for us. The soft top is fully stowed in just 9.5 seconds. One press of a button is all it takes. There are three petrol and two diesel engines to choose from, all of which are available with dual clutch transmission. Madeleine is testing out a standard 118 kilowatt gasoline engine with manual six-speed transmission. It takes the Beetle from zero to 100 kilometers in 8.6 seconds. It can reach a top speed of 205 kilometers an hour. Volkswagen XDS Electronic Limited Slip Differential System collects information from the wheel sensors and detects slippage. It puts on the brakes to slow the inside wheel on bends. Madeleine has a great first impression of the car. Its spacious interior makes for a comfortable drive. The moment she opened the soft top, a shaft of sunlight beamed into the car, putting her in the mood for a drive. Despite its size, it was robust and easy to steer, making it ideal for a relaxed drive. But she also stresses it's fun to hit the gas pedal and ramp it up a bit every once in a while. Einfach mal Kette geben und ein bisschen Gas geben, das macht auch total Spaß. Starting at 21,000 euros in Germany, the Beetle is the most affordable convertible in Volkswagen's range. The many customization options bring the price right up, though. With so much to choose from, the only thing really missing from the nifty package is a guarantee of good weather. This training session will be in the new Cadillac ATS. Does less mass mean better handling? We'll find out on a test track with snow and ice. We get the very best head start by adjusting the seat properly. Instructor Rolf Maritz says seat position is the most important thing. His first move is always to fasten a seat belt, if only to get rid of the annoying gong. He sets the seat as high as possible to get a good view, but without pushing his head into the roof. But he's still got lots of room to raise the seat. Then he adjusts the leg room. With his left foot propped against the wheel well, he pushes himself into the seat. An essential part of the driver's feeling for what the car is doing comes through his lower body. So it's important to be well grounded and close enough to the pedals to step hard on the brakes in an emergency. Next comes the backrest. An advantage here is being able to adjust the steering wheel. You can pull it out or up and find the truly optimal position. When the driver's shoulders are flush with the backrest, he should be able to lay his wrist flat on top of the steering wheel. Then they'll have the best leverage and directional control. That position lets you relax and drive the car and still be able to make the necessary maneuvers in an emergency not of your own making. The multi-link front axle and the five-link rear suspension make for improved driving dynamics. Patrick Hammond of Cadillac says the company started concentrating on driving dynamics years ago with impressive results and lap times for the CTS models. It's done lots of developing and testing and brought entire teams to Europe to optimize cars for European driving conditions. What are the differences between American and European Union models? Patrick explains that the differing legal requirements dictate many of the differences between European and American models in the lights, for example, and in chassis and suspension designs. But no matter how well a chassis is optimized for muddy and impassable road surfaces, 
too much speed will spin any car out of a curve. At the same time, the more powerful engines can spell greater safety. Wolf Marit says all-wheel drive is a clear advantage. Whether front or rear-wheel drive, four wheels are better and more efficient on slippery road surfaces. But for braking distance, all-wheel drive makes no difference whatsoever. The Cadillac SFX all-wheel drive offers a number of assistants that kick in when taking steep hills, for example, and optimize distribution of power to the individual wheels. Both Moritz seems quite satisfied. He says all these systems and the driving dynamics control really do help. They may not overcome the laws of physics, but anything that helps get us from point A to point B more safely and with fewer mishaps is positive. But even the most sophisticated technology won't replace careful driving. In 1948, West Germans were just starting to put their economy back on its feet. Franz Bierbichler Jr. was working for a brewery and driving a Mercedes. He had to start work every day at 6.30 a.m., but he was happy even to have a steady job in those hard post-war years. First thing in the morning, he would drive out his Mercedes 170 pickup and load it up with beer. West Germany depended on hard-working people like Franz Bierbichler to rebuild a largely ruined economy and get it humming again. The 1948 Mercedes 170 V pickup was basically the 1936 model from before the war, as is plain to see by the instruments. Daimler-Benz resumed production in 1946 under extremely difficult conditions. No electricity, no coal, no steel or iron. But at least some of the production facilities and supplies had escaped the ravages of the war intact. Soon, the Mercedes 170 pickup was joined by a van version, a sedan and a convertible. Up to six people could squeeze onto the pickup's wooden benches. A vertical backrest and padding made the front seat only slightly more comfortable. The 1.7-liter four-cylinder inline engine put out a modest 38 horsepower at 3,600 RPMs. In 1949, a diesel was offered, of the same size and with the same power. The 42-liter fuel tank was located in the engine compartment to save space. The bed was easy to open and load up. everyone could climb aboard for a rather leisurely drive. The pre-war chassis and two traverse leaf springs effectively prevented the driver from getting in too much of a hurry, or he'd risk losing his load. A heavy foot on the gas kept the transmission in line, synchronized gears or no. The worm and sector steering took a bit of muscle and responded only very approximately. The pickup was the true workhorse of Mercedes 170 range. Franz Bierbichler Jr. appreciated the simple and robust character of his little beer wagon, just as most drivers of this Mercedes pickup did in those days. Why he gave the horse my money?